first, congratulations. Um, but tell us, you know, much like AOC, who uh, took out a, a congressperson who was complacent, sitting in that seat for so many terms. I get it. At some point, you figure, I don't have to show up. You showed up. What did you do? And how did you know? When did you know that you were going to beat this man? Uh, well, we were confident throughout the campaign that, that we were going to be competitive and, and we would have a shot. Uh, we have an amazing team, so I can't say it's anything I did in particular. Our team is phenomenal. Uh, an amazing field program, an amazing comms team, an amazing uh, campaign manager, uh, and hundreds of volunteers supporting the campaign throughout. Um, I guess I knew we knew, like, on election day, like, literally, as we, because we did a bus tour uh, throughout the district, a four-day bus tour, and the final day was election day. And we went to every corner of the district, from Yonkers to Arsley to Pelham to New Rochelle, Mount Vernon, the Bronx. And everywhere we went, the reception was tremendous. People were excited. Uh, people wanted to hear what I had to say. They were recording me, giving little speeches. They were clapping when I said anything. And we were like, wait a minute. Like, this is, this is feeling pretty good. So we allowed ourselves on Election Day to kind of feel like this, this may happen. And the final thing we did was we stopped in Eden Wall projects and we walked from Eden Wall to White Plains Road. And I swear, it felt so celebratory and people were so excited. And they were like, hey, Mr. Bowman, hey, Jamal, I just voted for you. I'm about to go vote for you right now. And people were just, it was palpable. And then the final leg of that was us stopping at Yonkers Middle School at like 9 p.m. Polls are supposed to close at 930. And the line was down the block. People were waiting for two, two and a half hours to vote. And when we saw that, we were like, okay, like this is, this is, this is going to happen. It may be in a big way. And that's what the results on election night showed us. You know, we, 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 right now we're at, we have 62% of the vote and they still have mail-in ballots to count, but uh, the, the, the lead seems insurmountable at this point. Yeah. You have 30, you have almost doubled the amount of votes, 30,000 plus votes to his 18,000 plus votes. Um, and again, a career uh, politician, uh, Elliot Engel, out of there. Um, and and as, as you start to think about, because you're running for a reason. So tell us again, why did you want this seat? What was so important and impactful for you, Jamal Bowman, to be in Congress? So our district, if it were a country, we would have the eighth worst economic inequality of any country in the world. And that economic inequality falls along racial lines. So if you're driving through the North Bronx or Yonkers or parts of Mount Vernon and New Rochelle, you see abject poverty and you see black and brown people living in those spaces. If you drive through parts of Riverdale, Scarsdale, Bronxville, you see some of the highest priced real estate in the country, in the world even. So that inequality is unacceptable. That inequality has been persistent. And it continues because Congressman Engel never represented the entire district. He never fought for the entire district, never fought for housing and health care and jobs and education and all of the issues that disproportionately impact, impact black and brown communities. And for me, I had been a middle school principal in that district for 10 years. So I was working with kids from the hood. Like that was my, that was, those were my kids. Those were my families. That was my base. And I, I decided to run because, you know what, they deserve to be represented, too. And they deserve to have a representative who is going to uplift their voice and their issues while also building bridges and closing gaps between those from the other part of the district. So from the very beginning, it was all about building diverse coalitions to fight against institutional racism and classism. And that's what we were able to do. And when you see the early numbers, we doubled voter turnout in parts of the Bronx where people usually don't vote on a consistent basis. We double turnout and beat them by, by two to one or three to one in certain parts of that, uh, of the district there. So uh, this is a, a question I have, and it's particularly around the fact that you were able to turn out new voters or voter or non voters. Right. And listen, I, I get the energy, but what is it that you, that you did? That, what, is, what was it that you said that resonated with non-voters, traditionally people who were not in the fight? Can you just share a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, so the energy does matter. 
um, that does matter. People want to know that you're passionate about what you're doing and you're passionate about them. Um, I also, I come from the projects. I lived in East River projects. I was raised by a single mom. Uh, my sister was addicted to crack. Uh, I'm a victim of police brutality. Uh, I served the community as an educator for 20 years. So my story is their story. And then we, when we canvassed from the very beginning, we didn't target the consistent voters. We targeted everyone, including those who don't vote consistently, because we knew uh, if you engage them and make their voices a part of the conversation, a central part of the conversation, they would be excited and engaged, not just to vote for us, but to be a part of the movement overall. And that's what we're seeing, right? It, it, it's Enough is enough of ignoring people who, have, who will feel disenfranchised. They feel disenfranchised not because of, because of anything they did. It's because our elected officials haven't done enough to connect with them and build relationships with them and uplift the issues that matter most to them. So go to the projects, knock on some doors, and talk to people and listen to people. And don't just go once. Go two or three or four times. And listen to them and then tr and, gra and draft your policy platforms in alignment with their needs. If you do that and connect on our uh, collective sort of trauma and understanding and experiences, people are more likely to come out and be a part of the process.